just take a quick minute uh, to go over the syllabus um, and course policies and all that fun shit, and then we'll uh, <clears throat> we'll get started with the material, right? Um, okay, so uh, for those of you who don't know me, which is you, uh, my name is pronounced Moyer, right? Not Moir, not Moore, it's Moyer, it's okay, everybody gets it wrong. Um, what's relevant to everybody here is that uh, my office hours are Monday through Thursday, 10 to 12, right? So those are the hours when I have to be in the office. They're not the only times I can be in the office. So if you want to talk to me about an upcoming assignment or anything with which you think I might be able to help you, um, those are the times that I'm definitely going to be uh, going to be here, right? Um, I can be here at other times as well. Just don't expect that I will be. Um, so if you can't meet during my office hours but need to talk to me, shoot me an email. We'll work something else out. Um, okay. Uh, Quick thing about the textbooks, too. Um, so I just ran by the bookstore this morning, and I noticed that some of the they still don't have some of the textbooks in, because of course they don't. Um, so if you have trouble getting any of the books, let me know, and you know I'll PDF something. But yeah, um, not really supposed to do that, but if we have no alternatives, that's what we can do. Um, right, other things. Oh, I don't have this on the syllabus, but one thing I should tell all of you, I never check the Georgia View email function, right? Don't email me within Georgia View. Just send uh, any, con any communication with me, send it directly to my campus email address. Uh, that I check regularly. Um, I will always get back to you within 24 hours, um, maybe a little longer on the weekend, but um, yeah. Okay, in terms of what you're going to be doing in this class, the things you're going to be graded on, right? two exams, two papers, you're going to do a presentation on one of the texts, and there will be regular vocabulary and reading quizzes, right? So the, the quizzes are going to be really low stakes, right? Um, they're going to be 12 of each. They're each going to be worth one point, and I'm going to drop the grades for the lowest two. But the reading quizzes will be, um, essentially, they'll be surprise quizzes, so those will not be pre-announced. Basically, they're, well, they, they serve two purposes, right? One is to keep everybody honest and make sure you're keeping up with the reading. And the other purpose, is to um, help you pay close attention to details, right? Those are the kind of, so the quizzes are mostly going to ask you about details in the reading. The vocab quizzes um, are really there to help you with the final exam and to help you develop a vocabulary for talking about these kinds of texts. So, the kinds of, so they'll be completely open notes and open book, right? You'll do them over the weekend. They'll open on Friday morning. You'll have till midnight Sunday to complete them. Um, we won't do one this weekend, but you will have one the following weekend, right? Which will encompass terms from today and from Wednesday's class. Um, and what I will want from you on the vocab quiz is, right, I'm going to give you a list of 10 terms. And you're going to give me the name of the text that's relevant, if there is one, the name of the author of that text, if it has one, and a brief but substantial paragraph describing what the thing is and why it matters, right? And like I said, you'll do 12 of each of these types of quizzes. Um, and the vocab terms on the exams will be drawn directly from these vocabulary quizzes, right? So this will be giving you practice for the test. Okay, so any questions about assignments? Oh, so the midterm paper, by the way, you're gonna, is going to be uh, 1,000 to 1,500 words long, and it's just going to be a close reading of a single text from the first half of the semester, right? You're going to pick one text, and you're just going to make an argument about that text based on your reading of it and you know maybe our class discussion, right? 
The second is going to be a researched argument about a text from the second half of the semester. So that's going to require you to find five secondary sources and incorporate those into your argument, right? And in order to help you with this, right, this is why I've given every, I'm giving everybody these bibliographies uh, in each class period, right? Part of it is transparency so that I can show you that, like, look, like, I'm just not pulling all of this information out of my own head or out of my ass, right? Uh, this is the research that I did. These are the sources I consulted. Um, and part of it also is to give you a resource that you can use when you're doing your own uh, research, right? Whether you just want more information about a particular topic or whether you're trying to get something started for that final paper, right? So one of the most common complaints I hear when people are having trouble getting started on that research paper is, I can't find any sources. Well, what are we doing right here with these bibliographies? I'm giving you sources, right? And I know that you can find all of these, maybe not in our library, but certainly in the USG system, right? If you need help with library research, I'm happy to provide that too. Okay, um, other thing, okay, so the presentation. So if you're gonna give one 25 minute presentation on a text or topic to be assigned at a later date, right? So we'll, we'll, we'll talk through all of this, and this will be easy because there's only three of you. So we'll, just, we'll, we'll try to find something that each of you is interested in that we can make the focus of your presentation. Okay, so any questions about the assignments? Going once, going twice. Fantastic. All right, so there is an attendance policy in this class, right? I know that I'm recording lectures, but this doesn't mean don't come to class, right? It's not a substitute for coming to class and participating. Um, so you'll get essentially like three sick days, right, before uh, there are any penalties. Speaking of sick, right, the way we are dealing with uh, people getting COVID now, right, is essentially the, you know, following what the CDC guidelines are, right? So day one to day five, you isolate, you don't come to class or go anywhere else, right? Stay away from other people. Day six to 10, you wear a mask. Day 11, you can take the mask off and go about your business as normal, right? So that's the policy we're following. Um, okay, um, most, I mean, you're all, I think y'all are juniors and seniors by now, so you probably know how to work with the disability office if you need to. But remember that if you get accommodations for this class, right, you don't talk to me, you talk to them. And they'll get you set up. And you and I never have to have an awkward conversation about what you need. Um, oh, one thing I do need to know. There is somebody in this class who has requested a note taker. It is a paid position. So if you go to the Office of Disability Services and you say that you were interested in doing that for someone, um, then they will, yeah, you know, they'll, they'll hook you up with a, with a job, right? Okay, Writing Center, everybody knows how to, how to access the Writing Center, right? And I would encourage you to please go. I will give people extra credit if they go as well, right? Please go to the Writing Center. Um, you will have a better paper if you go to the Writing Center. I will get to read a better paper if you go to the Writing Center. Um, okay, cell phones. Okay, so those of you who've had class with me before are familiar with my electronics policy, right? I just, I don't allow any electronic devices in my classroom. The reason for this is based on neuroscience research, right? If that phone is on your desk, even if you're not touching it or interacting with, with it, it's a distraction um, because you're thinking about all of the things that it connects you to, even if you're not actively using it. So I found generally that students are more attentive if we just keep everything put away that we're not supposed to be using right now, right? Um, if you don't have that pull on your mind for these 75 minutes, um, you know, I found that you know, quiz grades have been better, test grades have been better, um, levels of engagement have been better, right? Students have been getting better overall grades in the class, 
since I started doing this, and I think that it's a big part of the reason why. Um, so that's why that is. It's not just that I, I hate things that young people love and you know want to deprive you of any joy. Although that's true too. Um, okay, um, and other stuff. Um, okay, the Title IX. Um, again, this is something you hear from probably all of your instructors. But if you inform me of any kind of uh, you know sex-based discrimination or harassment that you are subject to. Um, I am required to report it to the university's Title IX coordinator. I can't keep it a secret. I can't keep it between us, right? This doesn't mean don't come talk to me if you think I can help you, right? I will do my best to help you, but I also can't keep it a secret. Um, I am not legally allowed to do so. And I'm not allowed to talk about campus care, so you can just, you know, read that on your own. Okay, so does anybody have any questions about course policies or any? Everything's clear, we're good? All right, fantastic. So, let's start with the name of this course, which um, I think is a little bit problematic for reasons we're gonna get into. Right. I, didn't, I didn't name the course. It was already on the books before I got here. Um, but <clears throat> I want to start by interrogating this term post-colonial. And what I want to know is what do you all think this means? Okay, so yeah, I mean, literally what we're talking about is anything after colonization, right? Okay. All right, good, Kathy. Anybody else? <laughs> okay, um, like, are there any other thoughts or ideas that this conjures up? We can also put some pressure on these words colonial or colonization, right? Think about what that means. So of course, like the aftermath of being colonized and the shift it had um, with the natives, like different kind of natives and how the colonizers um, handled the situation. Okay. So if we're looking at post-colonial culture, or post-colonial literature, who's generating this? Who's creating this? The settlers or the natives? Yeah, okay, so this is a kind of return to cultural power in some sense by the natives of the colonized country, right? <clears throat> or at least an attempt at a return to cultural power, right? Um, and again, so then this idea of sort of like post or after, right? What does this suggest about what the relationship is now between the settler culture and the colonized culture? Where are the settlers now? Here. <laughs> What's that? Here. <laughs> right here, right now. <laughs> Well, think of this like in terms of, of, of a colonized country, right? If we're talking about a post-colonial country, are the settlers still in power? Yeah. Okay, why? Um, well, according to like, the news I've seen and everything, uh -huh. a lot of times people are saying like, oh, like, I belong here or get out of my country. Like that one senator who is actually native, American, uh -huh. like, you need to go back to your country. But this literally is built off of his, like where his tribe was, um, <coughs> country, uh -huh. you know? And people tend to forget that mm -hmm. America was colonized. Yeah. So I think because of the colonization, the post-colonial um, would be like, 
we have to simulate and adapt, or we get pushed mm -hmm. in and alienated. <coughs> Yeah, and I think like, like you're actually you're pointing to something really interesting that this is actually really complicated and a lot more complicated than it sounds. Um, particularly if you're talking about a, a country that was initially colonized a long time ago, right? The institutions that the settler culture brings with them get pretty deeply rooted, right? And even the way some of the native population begin to identify themselves, right? Some of them are going to identify more strongly over time with the settler culture than with whatever their culture of origin was, right? Um, and some of this has to do with just kind of geographical and political realities, right? So if you take, for example, a country like Nigeria. So the modern borders of Nigeria, right, the existence of the country Nigeria is largely a product of British colonialism, right? Historically, there was no country, you know, con no country called Nigeria before the late 19th century. What you had, right, you had Yorba Land, you had Yorba Land in one part of what's now Nigeria. You had, um, you know, the the Hausa and Fulani in another part of, the, of what's now Nigeria. You had the Igbo in another, right? These separate nations that spoke different languages had different, set, different religions and different sets of cultural traditions um, and were sometimes hostile to each other, right? We, saw, we, we see this play out to um, disastrous effect in the former French colony of Rwanda, right? where you know, the, you know, the, the Hutu and Tutsi people, um, who had long been enemies, are you know, suddenly sharing power in this you know, new nation that's formed out of French colonialism, and they use that institutional power um, to institute genocidal campaigns against each other, right? So, <clears throat> the basic problem that the post-colonial critic identifies, right, is like largely one of determining cultural identity, right? So the key thinker on this was a guy by the name of France Fanon. And Fanon wrote two very important books um, which you will see on your um, bibliography here, uh, Black Skin, White Masks, and The Wretched of the Earth. So The Wretched of the Earth is the earlier book. It's first published in French in 1961. And Fanon was not a literary critic, right? He's not necessarily talking about literature, but he is talking about cultural identity in the wretched of the earth. And he identifies kind of the post-colonial condition as this kind of attempt to start over when you're no longer politically dominated by some outside force, but that outside force has so obliterated the culture that existed before it, that there's nothing really for you to go back to. Right, you know, you know, maybe you know, people don't speak those original native languages anymore, right? I mean, you know, how many, you know, how many Native American languages, for example, how many Australian Aboriginal languages are we aware of that have you know gone extinct? And not even necessarily through you know physical violence, but through educational dominance of, say, like English language systems, right? One thing that you're going to frequently see reference to in post-colonial texts is the way a British educational system is exported to various colonies. And you're going to see a lot of writers and poets complain a lot about daffodils.
And it's not that they have anything particular against flowers or even against daffodils, right? The point of these complaints is that <clears throat> they're made to read these William Wordsworth poems about daffodils in school that have absolutely no reference to the conditions of their lives or the place they come from, right? They're reading these poems about daffodils, but none of them have ever seen one. And they have only the vaguest concept of what the fuck a daffodil is, right? So does anybody have any questions so far, any observations they'd like to make, just before I keep going here? And I will say that, like again, like this post, this concept of post-colonialism is a little bit problematic in some ways, and is you know is critiqued from both the left and the right. We'll talk about that in a minute. But I want to give you just kind of like a basic overview of what all this means, right, and what the basic theory is. So. <clears throat> talking in this class specifically about places that were once colonies of the British Empire, right? And what do you all know, if anything, about the British Empire? I know that's a very, very large question. <laughs> But one of the things I like to do, particularly in the early stages of a course, is figure out what you all know before I start you know, filling in information here. So when I mention the British Empire, like what does it make you think of? Huge tableware. What's that? Huge tableware. <laughs> Huge tableware. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's it's a big part of American history, right? We the North American colonies are so part of the earliest formation of the British Empire, right? Which is largely kind of product of the 18th century. And yeah, if we're looking at the British Empire, right? then we're probably, when we're talking about something that existed from roughly the 17th century through the mid 20th century, right? When most of the old uh, British colonies began to break away, right? And this process really accelerates after World War II. So, what, what, like, what modern countries do we think of as having been part of this empire? Australia. Okay, yeah, Australia, which is, again is one of those early, relatively early colonies, right? And what do we know about um, Australia's status within the empire? That's where they shipped the prisoners. Yeah, Australia was a penal colony. So yeah, the settlers who came to Australia were disproportionately uh, from the working classes and indeed usually had criminal records, right? Okay, other places we associate with the British Empire that we think of as having once been British colonies. Yeah, the US. And America's hat? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's right. Okay, so Australia, the US, Canada. Now, if we think about these three colonies, none of which we're going to be particularly focusing on in this course, what do these three have, colonies have in common? 
in terms of the relationship between the settler population and the native population. Well, blend in might be a little bit um, might not quite state the case exactly clearly, right? Basically, who becomes numerically dominant? Yeah, exactly. The settlers become numerically dominant over the native population, right? So Australia, the US and Canada are all today predominantly white, right? Although in the US in particular, um, demographics have been shifting um, in a way there, there are, I think 60% of the country is currently white or identifies as white. Um, whereas in the 70s it was like 90%. Then you also have colonies in India, and India, when it was part of the British Empire, would also have included Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Burma. Uh, by the end of the 19th century, parts of West and South Africa, much of the Caribbean, or the West Indies um, is British controlled. And even parts of Central and South America there's you know, what's, what's now the country of Guyana in South America and Belize in Central America were British colonies. So, I mean, you know, they've got a foothold on every continent. And <clears throat> a lot of the power that they generated out of the empire was economic. So what particular like consumer goods do we tend to associate even today with Britain, if you can think of them? Tea, yes. Good. Now where does tea actually come from? China. Yeah, China or India, right? You can't grow tea plants in Britain. It's too damn cold. Right? So yeah, so tea, which no British person had even tasted before the 17th century, we now associate very, very strongly with the British Empire, right? Anything else that we tend to associate, any other products we tend to associate with Britain? It's okay if you can't think of any. Tea is the big one. Was it cotton too, or was it like later on? Cotton was really um, is a product that's mostly kind of taken from the American colonies, but things like cotton and tobacco are certainly part of that trade triangle that exists between that existed between Britain, uh, West Africa, and um, and the Americas. But yeah, we can certainly think of those as imperial products as well, right? Cotton uh, tobacco. Now in the West Indies, the big products would have been sugar cane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And it's a, like, and sugar, like, the European appetite for sugar in the 18th and 19th centuries was intense, right? Europe actually does have its own kind of native sugar, but it comes from beets and it sucks. 
right? Cane sugar is vastly superior, but it also requires very specific growing conditions, and farming it is dangerous and labor intensive. So, who'd they get to do the farming? Yeah, sugarcane was produced mostly by slave labor, right? Or cane sugar was produced mostly by slave labor. All right, how many of you are familiar with that idea of the Atlantic Trade Triangle? Okay, Amaya, what do you, what do you remember about the, the Trade Triangle? Like, what do you know about how it worked? Kind of like, you know, how, like, if you're a trucker today, right, yeah. you go, you know, you carry one cargo to some place you expect to pick up another, and so on and so forth, right? So, yeah, it was about carrying, you started with a cargo of probably manufactured goods from Britain, you sailed to West Africa, you traded those manufactured goods for slaves, whom you then brought over to the Americas, you traded the slaves for... Um, tobacco or cotton or rum, right? Another byproduct of the sugarcane trade. And you come back to Britain and start the process over again, right? And really, like, the whole British banking system ends up being built on uh, this trade, right? I don't know if any of you have ever heard of Barclays Bank, or if you've heard of the Barclays Center in Brooklyn where the Nets play. Okay, that's a big old, that's a big old no. All right. Well, Barclays Bank, which is one of the, the biggest and most important banks in Britain, was founded by the Barclay brothers, who made their money as slave traders. So this particular trade, the slave trade, is very kind of deeply embedded in British economic conditions right, from a very early period. And indeed, even contemporary wealth, contemporary fortunes, were in many cases built on this trade. So. <clears throat> One of the primary motivations for empire was economic, right? You had, you know, trading tea and things like that. You had the East India Company. Who pretty much ruled India until about 1860. And you also had the Royal Africa Company, which monopolized the slave trade and existed from 1660 to 1821, when the slave trade was legally abolished in British colonies, right? Well, as we go through the course, we'll talk about ways in which it wasn't really entirely legally abolished, but yeah, 1821 is the year in which, at, least, at the very least, it's no longer profitable because of legal repercussions, right? And investors in these companies included um, important writers, composers, um, business people, even the royal family, right? So you had a lot of very important highly placed, uh, highly admired people who were making a fortune off of human misery, right? And, you know, the breakup of cultures in West Africa. So, <clears throat> And by the way, if anybody has any questions or anything they want to say at any point, please do feel free to stop me, right? 
So what I'd like to do now is kind of pause and step back a minute, if no one has anything they want to add. And I'd like to look at some of the literary responses to colonialism that were being made as early as the beginning of the 17th century, right? So I've given you two handouts here. Right, one is an excerpt from William Shakespeare's play, The Tempest. Um, any of you familiar with The Tempest? Any of you read this play before? Or, you know, okay, okay, what do you know about it? What do you remember about it? Oh, I read it, I think, back in one of the literature classes. I can't remember which one it was. But okay. We read it, and we had to reenact it as like a reactive passing, I believe. Oh, cool. So, it's, it wasn't interesting. Okay. Okay, so let's kind of look at the first page here. And I want to look here at the character Caliban, right? And his dialogue with his master, the magician Prospero, right? So um, is anybody willing to, um, to read Caliban for us? OK, Kathy, you read Caliban. Mm -hmm. um, I'll read Prospero. And would one of you be willing to read Miranda? Miranda speaks up here. Okay, thank you. And I want you to pay particular attention here to what Caliban's grievances against Prospero are, right? What does he complain about in his treatment from Prospero? And what are Prospero's excuses for treating Caliban in this way, right? So let's start at the bottom of the page here. It's a Prospero to Caliban. Thou poisonous slave, got by the devil himself upon thy wicked dam, come forth. As wicked do as ever my mother brushed with raven's feather from unwholesome sand, drop on me both a selfless blow on you and bless you as you all. For this be sure, tonight thou shalt have cramps, side stitches that shall pen thy breath up. Urchins shall forth at vast of night that they may work all exercise on thee. Thou shalt be pinched as thick as honeycomb. Each pink pinch more stinging than bees that made them. I must eat my dinner, this island is mine by Cycorax, my mother, which thou hast taken from me. When thou camps first, thou strokest in the enemies, much of me, what is due me? Water with berries in it, and teach me how to be a bigger white and how to less ever in my day and night. And then I love thee and show thee all the qualities of the isle. The fresh spring vine, its fair and place and fertile. Cursed be I that did so all the charms of Sarah serve chorus. So let's be those that slight on you. For I am all the subject that you have, which first was mine, O king. And here you sign me in this whole rock while so you do keep me from me the rest of the all the island. Thou most lying slave, whom stripes may move, not kindness. I have used thee, filth as thou art, with humane care, and lodged thee in mine own cell, till thou didst seek to violate the honor of my child. Oh, oh, oh. what it had been done, thou didst, thou didst prevent me. I had people else thus I was known to the countenance. Which any print of goodness would not, um, a war slave, which any print of goodness would not take, being capable of all evil, I pity thee, took pains to make thee speak, taught thee each out, one thing or other. When thou, when thou didst not savage, know thine own men, but was gabble like a thing most brutish, I endowed thy purposes with the words that made them known by thy vile race. Thou, thou though, though thou didst learn, had that in which good natures could not abide to be with. Therefore, was thou Deservedly confined into this world, who has deserved more than a prison. You taught me language, and my profit on it is I know how to curse. The red plague rid you for learning me your language. Hag seed, hence. Fetch us in fuel, and be quick. Thou art best to answer other business. Shrugst thou malice? 
If thou neglect or dost unwillingly what I command, I'll rack thee with old cramps, fill all thy bones with aches, make thee roar that beasts shall tremble at thy din. No, pretty thee, I must obey his heart. And his art is of such power, it would control my dance god, Sidibos, and make a vessel of him. So, slave, hence. So, let's pick this interaction apart here, right? So, what do you know, well, like, what stands out to you here about this? Well, the slave is talking back. Okay, yeah. Caliban is talking back, right? And what are, yes, what are, what are Caliban's complaints specifically? Mm. Why is he angry about the treatment he's received from Prospero? They've taken away from him, and um, they're isolating him. He said he had people also. That's on the second page. Uh huh. Yeah, Caliban was here first, right? He was his own person before mm -hmm. um, Prospero. He said, which person was my own king? So I'm guessing he was his own. Yeah, apparently the only two people on the island before. Prospero and Miranda showed up there were uh, Caliban and I guess prior to them showing up his mother Sycorax, right? So <clears throat> How does Caliban feel he's been tricked by Prospero? He shows like the glorious side like the fancy shit like fairies in water, like uh -huh. some influencer stuff. Yeah. And that's what he, he showed Caliban, uh -huh. and he taught him like other things to like win him over, but in the end he um, switched 180 on him and used him as a slave instead. So yeah. Yeah, what did, what did Caliban show Prospero in return? Well, he said, all the charms of Sycorax, toads, beets, beetles, bats, light on you. Um, that, he's cursing Prospero oh, there, right? Sorry. But look a little bit above that, right? And then I loved thee and showed thee all the qualities of the isle, the fresh springs, brine pits, barren place, and fertile. So what did he essentially do for Prospero after a little bit of petting and a little bit of education? Can you repeat that one more time? Pardon? Can you repeat your question one more time? Yeah, what did, what did Caliban do for Prospero in exchange for Prospero giving him a little bit of education and, you know, treating him at least initially gently, right? What did this lead Caliban to do for Prospero? And then I loved thee, and showed thee all the qualities of the isle, the fresh springs, brine pits, barren place, and fertile. I guess it means like showing that way water, yeah, it's like, oh, hey, water with berries in it, hot damn, right? Let me show you all of the island's resources, right? But then who gets to bogart all of those resources? Yeah, not Caliban, right? Once he's shown all of these things to Prospero, Prospero takes it over and keeps Caliban confined to this rock, right? Now what's Prospero's excuse for this? And does Caliban deny it? What's that? He says right here, the honor of my child, so you do all that for some honor for his king or something. 
Well, what, what, is, what does that mean to, to violate someone's honor? What did Caliban try to do? There's actually a more specific um, and more physical meaning. So, to violate Miranda's honor, right? Oh, Cal yeah. <laughs> yeah. Caliban tried to have sex with Miranda, right? And then he says, you know, after like, oh ho, oh ho, would it have been done? Thou didst prevent me. I had peopled else this isle with Caliban's, right? If you hadn't stopped me, then I would have made more of me to outnumber you, right? And what does is, what is Prospero threaten to do every time Caliban talks back to him? How does Prospero deal with Caliban's um, responses? Yeah. Yeah, he always gets Caliban to comply by threatening pain, right? If you don't do what I tell you to, I'm going to cause you these, I'm going to use my magic to cause you these aches and pains, right? And then you'll regret it. So, <clears throat> On the one hand, Prospero seems to be threatening Caliban with knowledge in some way, right? Like, I know how to do things to you. So, you know, flaunting his notion of himself as civilizationally superior. Um, but the other thing I kind of want to lean on here a little bit, too, is this conversation between Prospero and, not Prospero, between Caliban and Miranda, right? What is Miranda say about the way Caliban talks and the way he used to talk. It's not that he doesn't have a language, right? He just doesn't have their language. But then if we see what he's doing with their language, right? You taught me language, and my profit on it is, I know how to curse. The Red Plague rid you for learning me your language. So what is he able to do to them since he knows their language? Curse them out. Yeah. <laughs> he can, yeah, he can curse them and defy them in ways that they understand, right? He can turn their language back against them. And this is, for some post-colonial theorists, right, um, a kind of originary literal, literary moment for the idea of post-colonialism, right? Like the colonized subject taking the language and the institutions of the settler and turning them back on him, right? And Caliban actually gets most of the best speeches in this play, right? The most beautiful and flowery language in the play largely comes from him. The language he's speaking is not his native language, but he's the play's best talker. Now, I also want to take a minute to um, point to a text quickly. We're not going to go through this in detail, but I've given you this um, Ben John, the photocopy is Ben Johnson text as well, called uh, "The Mask of Blackness." Um, which 
also kind of hints at the, well, it doesn't hint at it, it kind of like explicitly deals with these complicated relationships between uh, Britain and Africa, right? So one thing to note is that there's been contact between Britain and Africa since the days of the Roman Empire, right? And trade between them. Um, and, you know, plenty of traffic back and forth. But does anybody know what a court mask is? Yeah. Yes. This is not something any of you have heard before? Okay, so court masks were a popular form of entertainment among the nobility in Britain in the 17th century. So mask, think like masquerade, right? So it is, it's a theatrical performance, but it's a theatrical performance that usually takes place at a party. And in addition to some professional actors uh, performing the main speaking roles, the guests at the party also put on costumes and take on roles in the performance. So, for example, in this case, um, the nymphs and the daughters of the River Niger would, be, would have been people who were attending the party, right? So British nobles attending this party hosted by King James I um, on Twelfth Night in 1605. Do you all know what Twelfth Night is, by the way? Okay, so you know the whole 12 days of Christmas thing? Um, Twelfth Night is the last of those nights, so January 5th. And Twelfth Night was actually, twelve, like, traditionally, Twelfth Night and New Year's Day were actually when the big parties were, not on, not on Christmas. Just a little piece of side information there for you, right? But the basic gist of this little performance is that the daughters of the River Niger come to Albion, that is Britain, looking for a cure for their particular affliction, right? And it references um, the old uh, Greek myth in which um, Phaeton, the son of the sun god, loses control of his father's chariot um, and essentially creates black people by burning the skin of people in Africa, right? So they are coming to Britain to you know, bathe in the waters off the British coast, and one assumes you know maybe also the River Thames. Although anybody who bathes in the River Thames is asking for trouble, um, and probably a host of parasitic diseases. Um, but yeah, so these daughters of the River Niger are essentially coming to Britain to be made white, right? So it's asserting here the power of the British king and his court, right? to remake other nations in his own image. And this is the, um, the basic tone that a lot of colonialist discourse takes over the next couple of centuries, right? So on the one hand, there's the hard-headed economic stuff, right? You know, these, these corporations are making a lot of money trading in these colonial goods. But this, off, this also kind of comes to be um, connected with this idea of spreading British civilization to other corners of the globe, right? British civilization meaning here you know, parliamentary democracy, industrialization, the Anglican Church, the British school and class systems, and, oh shit, what was that last one? Um, and, 
This is why I need to write things down. Um, all right, whatever the last one was, I can't remember it, but <laughs> you get the idea, right? That like, the basic, like the basic, the basic social structures of Britain, right, um, are to be transferred to other parts of the empire, right? Remaking them in the image of the quote-unquote mother country. And so one of the big exponents of this particular philosophy, I don't know, like if any of you have heard of the, uh, the Rhodes Scholarship, do you know what that is? Okay, so the Rhodes Scholarship um, is a very famous um, scholarship program that uh, takes students from, mostly from former parts of the British Empire, including the United States and Canada, and brings them to Oxford to be educated for a few years, right? And it's named for a guy by the name of Cecil Rhodes. Seen here in a political cartoon, right? The Rhodes Colossus, right? So Rhodes was known, uh, Rhodes, let me give you the guy's dates, 1853 to 1902. was heavily involved in um, diamond mining operations in what is now South Africa. That was kind of where he made his fortune. And for a few years in the 1890s, he was president of um, what was then called the Cape Colony, uh, which was the British part of what is now South Africa. And Rhodes, um, what this cartoon is referencing, right, he's got electrical wires attached to his hands and feet, and he's standing with one foot on South Africa and another on Egypt, right? He intended to build um, railroads and electrical wiring systems all across Africa. But Rhodes was also um, a hardcore British supremacist and believed very much in the superiority um, not just of white people over other um, ethnicities, but of the British over other white people, right? And that bringing students from elsewhere in the world to expose them to Britishness, right? The more British he could make the world, the better the world would be. And this is why there are people now who protest the Rhodes Scholarship um, and you know, kind of want to change its name and its purposes, right? But <clears throat> Rhodes is like a kind of extreme example, but he's hardly atypical for the period. In fact, like your average British person, by and large, didn't question whether the empire was a good or a bad thing. Um, you know, as long as you know the, the tea and the sugar kept flowing, right? As long, the operations of it were, invis were invisible to most people unless they happen to have, you know, say, a relative in the colonial service um, somewhere in India or Africa or the West Indies, Australia, whatever, right? So this is the basic background we're going to be operating from, right? Now, one thing that I do want to note, I did mention earlier in the class that the idea of post-colonialism has come in for critique both from the right and from the left, right? So I want to mention two of those prominent critiques so that you can look these things up for yourself if you want to. You kind of show that like this is not, um, some of these ideas are not universally accepted, right? So the critique from the right, the most prominent of those guys, those critics, is a guy by the name of Niall Ferguson. He's a historian. And in particular, um, his 2003 book, Empire, How Britain Made the Modern World, argues that British imperial practices 
uh, by, um, you know, say, bringing modern medicine um, <clears throat> to various parts of the world, um, you know, through you know, rural electric electrification schemes and things like that, ended up doing more good than harm. So I think he, Ferguson's arguments are largely focused on material benefits um, that colonized nations received from Britain, right? Um, the critique for the, the most prominent critique from the left comes from a philosopher and literary critic by the name of Ayaz Ahmad. Uh, he's, uh, he was from India. Um, and his book is called In Theory, Classes, Nations, Literatures. And it was published in 1992. And Ahmad's argument is that the idea of post-colonialism suggests a kind of incompleteness um, or inferiority on the part of formerly colonized cultures, right? That the idea that these cultures cannot, can, you know, can only define themselves now against the settler culture um, is itself um, <clears throat> wrong-headed and prejudiced, right? So I just wanted to make you aware of these critiques of post-colonialism in case you wanted to check them out or incorporate them into your own thought or your own argument, right? And to know that you know what, the, the stuff I'm talking about here isn't the only game in town. All right, so that's about all I have for you today. I know I hit you with a lot of information today. Um, my hope is that per, uh, in the future, um, these sessions won't feature quite so much of me talking. Um, I'd like to hear uh, more from you, but you know, today we're just doing background, right? Um, so does anybody have any questions before I give you the reading questions for the Louise Bennett poems? Okay, everybody got the Louise Bennett handout, right? Everybody's got one of those? for next time. Just keep these in mind. Uh, I, I prefer to rewrite them down because then it's, there is actually a connection between uh, muscle memory and brain memory. And uh, you're more likely to remember them if you're in, think about them if you write them. I'm genuinely not trying to be a dick. 